to you this morning to just give you thanks first of all. Thank you Father for watching over us last night and waking us up to the rise of a new day. Father we thank you for all the spiritual blessings that we enjoy in this life through your son Jesus Christ. And we thank you Father this morning for the opportunity to come together even though it's digitally to worship and to give you praise this morning. Father God, may the things that we say and do be acceptable into your sight and through what we give you this morning that you will receive all the glory and the honor. Bless us as we go into this worship experience. It is in the name of Jesus we pray it. Amen.
Romans, the chapter is five. Verse beginning at number six. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for once again allowing your children to humbly approach your throne of grace. Father, first and foremost, we come asking for forgiveness of sin. And also, Father, we would like to offer thanksgiving for all that you have allowed us to this point. We pray, Father, that you continue blessing us as our hearts are steadied on today's worship. We pray, Father, for those that are sick and shut in, Father, and we pray that you always bring them to our remembrance so that we can comfort them in their hour of need. We pray also, Father, for the speaker of the hour. We pray that all that you have given him understanding to study, Father, that it comes to his remembrance as he parse out to your people, thus saith the Lord. We pray that what he says will enlighten those that are listening today online. And we pray, Father, that it will bring souls to your harvest. We ask also, Father, that you will just let us pray for the leadership of this world, Father. Those that are in high places, Father. We ask that we pray for their guidance and their health. But most of all, Father, we pray that they understand that you are the reason they are in the position they are in and that they go throughout their day not being wicked towards the people, but giving them a way to be comforted as they walk throughout their days, Father, trying to do their daily activity. And we ask, Father, that us as your children never be hindered when we try to give those that are our neighbors, our friends, and our family the good news, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you once again for all that you have allowed us, and we pray, Father, that we can continue to grow in your grace and in your love. In Jesus, the Holy Spirit, in your name we pray. Amen. Yeah. 
Yeah. 
to our members, visitors, family, and friends. I want to take this moment to welcome you to the digital worship space of the Church of Christ at Northside, located in Detroit, Michigan. And to our visitors, we want you to know that we consider you as our honored guest. And it's our prayer today that your visit with us will be strengthening and encouraging and edifying, and that you will want to come back and join us because in some way you have benefited by being with us today. We extend to you an open invitation to all of our activities, whether in the digital realm or the physical, of the Church of Christ at Northside. And wherever you find yourself able and available, just come on and be with us as soon and as often as you possibly can. It's true saying that God has blessed us. He has been good to us. He has showered us with his grace and his mercy and his love and his blessings. And if you ever want evidence of that fact, just consider that for at least one more time, you are on this side of the timeline of life and you are being seen and not being viewed. I'm going to ask that you will pray with me and then we'll go into our message for the morning. The gracious God, merciful Father, it's at this time that we come before your throne, come into your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts. Father God, we have so much to be thankful for. All of the blessings that you have so graciously poured out on us each and every moment of our lives, whether they be material blessings or physical blessings or especially the spiritual blessings that we have that were secured through the death of your son and our elder brother, Jesus Christ. Father God, we ask right now that for everybody that is in this digital worship space this morning, that uh, you will give them open hearts right now to receive with meekness your engrafted word. Father God, let that word take root into their hearts and be lived out in their lives so that through their works and through their lives, you may be glorified. And Father God, right now as it befalls me, I pray that you will hide me behind the cross, that it's not my words that are heard, but your words, and that it's not my will that is done, but your will, that through all of our efforts here this morning, you will receive all glory and all honor. Right now, we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I'm going to ask that you will join me in the fifth chapter of Paul's letter to the Roman Christians. Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, and we'll begin our reading this morning for our context at verse number 6. Romans, the chapter is 5. Verse beginning at number six. Here Paul writes to the Roman Christians and by extension to us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Sir Edwin Landseer was one of the most famous painters of the Victorian era. His talent developed early 
and he had the first showing of his work at the Royal Academy when he was at the ripe old age of 13 years old. He was commissioned to do a number of paintings and official portraits of the royal family and even gave private lessons to Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. But he was best known for his depictions of the natural settings and life in the Scotland Highlands. And one day as he was visiting a family in an old mansion in Scotland, one of the servants spilled a pitcher of soda water leaving a large stain on the wall. And while the family was out for the day, Lanseer remained behind. Using charcoal, he incorporated the stain into a beautiful drawing. And when the family returned, they found a picture of a waterfall surrounded by trees and animals. In essence, he used his skill to make something beautiful out of what had been an unsightly mess. What's the moral of that story? It is simply this. God works much the same way in our lives. The things that we think of as weaknesses and handicaps can, through his grace, can become our greatest strengths. And the very things he uses the most to bring glory to himself, God's grace, in essence, provides the strength to meet every challenge and overcome every weakness. And now for me, this passage of scripture that we just read into our hearing this morning joins other great mountaintop passages like Isaiah 53 or the 23rd Psalm or Hebrews 11, Philippians 4 or John chapter 3 and being among the greatest in the word of God. All these passages that I have mentioned, as well as others, have long brought comfort to the hearts of people. And here in this particular passage in Romans 5, we find the Apostle Paul rehearsing the benefits that are ours if we're children of God. These six verses make plain the great provisions that have come our way through the death of our Lord Jesus. And by virtue of our placing our faith in him for salvation, these verses tell us what we are without him, what he did for us, and what we have become because of his sacrifice. And I want to draw your attention this morning specifically to verse number eight. And the last phrase of that verse. And then look at the last two words there for us. Those two words for us sum up the content of this message. And as the Lord gives me space this morning, I would like to deal with the thought. He did it for me. He did it for me. First thing I have to think about is the sinner's pitiful condition. Look again at the passage beginning at verse number six. Paul says, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. 
For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Here in those verses, Paul lets us know that man's condition without him, without God, can be summed up by four descriptive terms. Number one, without strength. Number two, ungodly. Number three, sinner. And number four, enemies. And these four terms describe the condition of all men who are lost in sin. This is God's portrait of humanity apart from him. God says, first of all, the sinner is a weak man. He says again in verse number six, for when we were yet without strength. Now that phrase without strength carries the idea of being powerless. It speaks of a person who's utterly helpless with no means of escape. And the idea there is that the lost sinner stands before God with absolutely no ability to change what he is. We are powerless to escape sin. We are powerless to escape death. We are powerless to resist the devil. We are powerless to please God in any way without him. And the whole essence of that statement is that man is unable to change his sinful nature by his own effort. He is totally without strength and he is weakened by his sin. Then God lets us know also that the sinner is a wicked man. He goes on to say in verse number six, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now that word ungodly comes from a word in the, the, the Greek, which uh, refers to those without reverence or fear of God. It, it literally means to live your life as if God does not exist. And because we are helpless to change our sinful nature, we will live our lives as we please without regard to God or for his law and will. Now, 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 understand something this morning. Now, I don't want you to get it mixed up. To be ungodly does not mean that one must wallow in sin. See, the unsaved person even if they're out there doing all kind of good deeds, is just as godless as an Adolf Hitler. See, when a person refuses to bow before the Lord in faith for salvation, he is essentially setting himself or herself up as their own God. Therefore, they do as they please. They worship him themselves without any regard for the true God. Hence, they are godless. Then God lets us know here the third thing, that the sinner is a wayward man. He says in verse number eight, in that while we were yet sinners, that word sinners comes from 
a, a, a word in the original language that literally means to miss the mark. It carries with it the idea of an archer aiming at a bullseye and to the best of their ability, shooting the arrow and then missing the target. It pictures man as he tries and fails his way through life. See, see, no matter how good you may try to be, you can't be good enough. And though you might aim high and set high standards, still you will always fall short of God's standard. Man always misses the mark. See, this is why attempting to get to heaven by good works will never work. Man can never be good enough to get himself to God. No matter how close you may come, you will always fall short. And the truth of the matter is, to be almost right is to be all the way wrong. It's like being pregnant. You never hear anybody say that they're a little pregnant or they're almost pregnant. No, you either are or you're not. And you can't be right in and of yourself. Isaiah put it real clearly when he said man's righteousness is as filthy rags. And I wish I had some time this morning to go into what that is. But, but just understand, in your righteousness, you will always be wrong. But then God lets us know the fourth thing the sinner is. In verse number 10, he lets us know the sinner is a warlike man. He says, for if when we were enemies... And that word enemies simply means an adversary. Basically what the Bible is telling us there is that when we were lost, we were in the devil's camp. When we are opposed to God, we are the enemy of God. And no matter how much you may talk of loving the Lord, if you are unsaved, you're a liar. God says the lost are his enemies. And I hope you can see from those four phrases or those four terms that apart from Jesus, man is in a hopeless situation. Paul lets us know about the sinner's pitiful condition there. But then he goes on to let us know about the Savior's priceless compassion. Look again at verses 6 through 8. He says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man one would die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want you to see a couple of things here about the Savior's priceless compassion. First thing is the superiority of his compassion. Here, Paul lets us know that there are a few people in life that someone might die for. And I want to ask you this morning, who might those people be in your own life? Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your mother and father. Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's a couple of close friends. If you really took the time to think it through, there would only be a very few people for whom you would think about giving your life without hesitation. I want you to imagine for a moment 
that you're sitting in a restaurant with your child. When suddenly a gunman uh, uh, shows up in the restaurant, it begins shooting people around you. What's your immediate response? Do you hide under a table? Do you try to get away? Do you try to overpower the gunman? Or somehow protect your child? For a man named James F. Kidd of Wheaton, Illinois, the answer was easy. He was visiting his son one day who was stationed at Fort Bragg in Texas. They went to a nearby restaurant to eat. And while they were eating, a gunman came in and began just firing indiscriminately into the customers. And when it was over, 11 people had been shot and killed, including James Kidd. When the shooting started, he used his own body to shield his son from the bullets. And he himself died from a gunshot wound to the back. Later in an interview, his wife said he was a good man, a good father, and a good husband, and he died saving his son. We've all heard of, uh, of people who gave their lives or who sacrificed themselves for somebody else. And, and although those are examples of rare courage and sacrifice, they all have one common thing. They demonstrate the human capacity to give ourselves for the sake of those we love. Now, our family and friends are one thing. But I just want you to think about this for a second. Can you imagine giving your life for an enemy? So you see, I don't care what you say. Human love has its limits. But thanks be to God, the love of God does not. Verse 6 here tells us this is exactly what Jesus did. He didn't die for the good. He didn't wait for the bad to get good. The Bible says here Christ died for the ungodly. But I also want you to see here the statement in his compassion. See, notice here in verse 8 how the love of God transcended anything that humanity is able to produce. Here Paul lets us know that he put his great love on display when Jesus Christ died for those who were yet sinners. You see, while we were still weak and wicked and wayward and warlike, Jesus died for you and Jesus died for me. He didn't die simply for his friends. Paul says he died for his enemies. He died for those who had crucified him. He died for those who directly and indirectly oh, reject him. He died for the ungodly. And I just want you to imagine again. I just want you to return in your mind to that restaurant near Fort Bragg. And suppose that that soldier was a total stranger. What if James Kidd had protected a total stranger? You might say, well, well, people just don't do that. And you would be right partially because human nature recoils at the thought of doing good to one's enemies. But while man doesn't do that, God did and still does. That's exactly what happened at Calvary. Jesus Christ died for the sins 
of his enemies. Jesus Christ died for those who would stand in rejection of him. Jesus Christ died, Paul says, while we were yet sinners. He threw himself on the grenade of God's wrath and took the bullet of God's anger. And he died to deliver those who hated him. And that's some compassion right there. And I just want you to get out of your mind for a moment. This, this crazy thought that some folk have that goes something like this. If God is a God of love, then why do bad things happen? See, see, that's some foolishness there. See, if there's a doubt in your mind to the love of God, I need to challenge you this morning to take a look back to a place called Calvary. And there you will see a holy God, a sinless God, dying for the creature that despises him. Look at him as his life leaves his body. Watch as his blood runs down the cross. Listen as that blood drips in big pools on the ground. Hear him as he gasps for breath and gives his life as a sacrifice for sin. Look at all that broken and bleeding body hanging there and tell me with a straight face that God doesn't love you. There has never been and there will never be a greater demonstration of God's love than that of a broken and dead Savior on a cross on a place called Calvary. Paul here lets us know about the sinner's pitiful condition. He then went on to tell us something about the Savior's priceless compassion. And then he ends this thing up letting us know about the saint's precious conversion. Look at with me one more time, verses 9 through 11. Paul says, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Look at what Paul says about our, our conversion. First of all, he lets us know about our position. Paul says much more than being now justified by his blood. Now that word justifies, we, we talked about it before. In fact, we talked about it last week. But, but just as a refresher, that word means to declare a person or to look upon a person as not guilty. Our position in God when we're saved through Jesus Christ, is justified. Then Paul says something about our protection in that same verse. He says, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And because we're in Jesus Christ, we're protected from the wrath of God. And to simply put it, no child need, of God need to ever fear having to die and go to hell because Jesus has already paid the price and quenched the wrath of God toward those who believe and stay in him. We're protected in our position. 
But then also he goes on to say in verse 3, he tells us something about our peace. Verse 10, he says, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. That word reconcile comes from a word in the Greek language that means to take enemies and to make them into friends. What does that say? It says this. No longer are we in opposition to God. We have been brought together through the blood of Jesus Christ. God has called a truce. God has put away the battle flags. And we're no longer fighting, but we are at peace with God. And we're at peace simply because through Jesus, God made peace with us. We have peace with God and we're saved from wrath through God. We're protected from that wrath by our position. But Paul lets us know something else. Paul tells us at the end of verse number 10 that he's our preservation. Look at what he says. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. These words tell us that Jesus is alive this evening, first of all. And this doesn't have anything to do with the life he lived here on earth. Although that life on earth only lasted for 33 years, it started in eternity and it will go on through eternity. It has everything to do with the life he lives in heaven right now. Well, what's he doing in heaven? There's two things I want you to know this morning. First thing that the Bible lets us know is that Christ is our advocate. Look at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1 with me real quickly. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. John writes this, My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus, the righteous. God right now is advocating. He's, he, he stands in the position where he's arguing our case before God. But not only is he our, he our advocate, Paul also lets us know that he's our intercessor. The Hebrew writer over in Hebrews chapter 7, verse number 25 Go there with me real quick. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 25. The Hebrew writer says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And that word uh, to make intercession simply means he stands before God uh, between us. And he, he, he speaks in our behalf. He pleads on our behalf. We're saved by his life. We're saved because he lives and what he's doing right now on our behalf. And then Paul goes on to verse 11 and lets us know that in addition to being uh, in addition to considering our preservation and our peace and our protection and our position, we ought to consider our praise. Verse 11 says uh, this over in, uh, back over in uh, uh, Romans chapter 5. He said, we joy in God. That is, because these things are true, because we are saved. Because we can be secure in our salvation, we ought to be filled with praise to God. And if there was ever a reason to praise the Lord, God gives it to you right here in his word. And I know that these may be difficult days for you as a believer, as a child of God. You might feel that you have situations you're in where, where there's no real reason to praise. But if you're saved, that's all the reason you need. Then Paul ends this whole thing 
by letting us know something about our privilege. Look at what he says to cap off verse number 11. By whom we have now received the atonement. This phrase reminds us that we have been made one with God. I just want you to think about that for a moment. Oh, lost, hell-bound sinners have been brought into a personal relationship with the God of heaven. And it isn't just any old relationship, but it's the relationship of a father and child. We have been brought nigh or we have been brought close to God through the blood of Jesus. And it's a great privilege that should never be taken for granted. You see, all throughout history, man has wanted to be brought near to God. That's why Israel in its history sacrificed millions of sheep and cows and birds on their altars. That's why every year Muslims sacrifice millions of animals on Mecca. They want to try to get close to God. But what the blood of those dead animals in those dead religions could never do for them, the blood of Jesus does for us. And I just look at these verses and I marvel that God would do all of this just for me. But he did it. The blessings that we have are far greater than your mind could ever begin to comprehend. And in light of these truths, I just need to ask you this morning, where do you stand with God? Are you saved? Are you as close to him as you need to be? Are you guilty of being in love with Jesus? Or has your love fallen short? If you find that you are short, if you find that you're not where you ought to be in your relationship with Jesus, if you find that somehow you're far away, understand something. Paul lets us know right here, he, he did all of this to bring us back to God. And if you are a child of God this morning and you find yourself a, a, a straight away from him, now is your time to come back. Just like that prodigal son over in Luke 15, it's, it's real easy. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. You'll find that the Father is ready, willing, and desirous to bring you back in relationship with him just as that Father did with that Son. If you find yourself a guilty distance away from God this morning and you haven't met him in the pardoning of your sin, you need to understand something this morning. As we said at the beginning, he did it all for me, which means he did it for you too. Let me repeat verse 8 again. The capstone of this whole thing. For God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I just got to ask you the question this morning. If he was willing to die for you, shouldn't you be willing to live for him? If he was willing to die for you, shouldn't you be willing to live for him? You can start that life in him right now. You've heard his word. You heard how Jesus Christ came and how he died for your sins. 
understand in addition to that, that he was buried in a borrowed tomb. But on the third day, he arose with all power and authority in his hands. Believe exactly that. That's the basis of the gospel message that Jesus Christ loved you. He died for you. He was buried for you. But he was raised on the third day for you with all power. And let that belief, let that faith, first of all, lead you to repentance. It's your change of mind that causes a change of direction and a change of attitude. You turn away from whatever it is you're turned toward, and now you turn to Christ. Let it lead you, secondly, to confession, where you you confess. And that simply means that you stand in agreement with. You confess that Jesus is the Christ and that he's God's son. And thirdly, let it lead you to the watery grave of baptism for the remission of every sin that you have ever committed and will ever commit. And if you live a faithful life, one day heaven in all of its glory will be yours for eternity. What's your desire this morning? If it's prayer, we'll pray with you. If you need to be restored, we'll aid you on that restoration journey. If it's baptism for the remission of your sins, we'll make sure that you can be baptized this morning. All we ask you to do is to reach out to us using the contact information on your screen. Whether it's the email address that's there or whether it's the phone number that's there. Reach out to us and we'll immediately reach out to you and facilitate whatever your need is this morning. The message is yours and I hope somebody was edified and encouraged. And I hope somebody has also been caused to think about their standing in Jesus Christ and their need for salvation this morning. And as we end this message, I just want you to know that God loves you. And we at the Church of Christ at Northside do too. take communion, let us be mindful of the sacrifice that Christ has made for all. I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23, as we focus our hearts on the Lord's Supper. For I received of the Lord that which I also deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. For after the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread 
and drink of that cup. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as you allowed us once again to approach your throne of grace, we ask, Father, that our minds be fixed upon Christ and all that he has done for us. We ask, Father, that as we take these symbols of his shed blood and broken body, we do so with the proper heart. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Singing at the cross, at the cross, and where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart, it rolled, it rolled away. It was there I think and I will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 11 
God of heaven, God of grace and mercy, God of love, we thank you this morning for allowing us to gather this morning in this digital worship space to bring you glory and honor. We pray, Heavenly Father, that the things that we've said and done be pleasing into thy sight, and if not, we ask your forgiveness. And Father God, we ask your blessings continued upon us as we walk day by day, trying to give you glory through our lives and through our actions. Father, bless us right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This ends our worship service online broadcast for today. We thank you for tuning in, and again, we hope that you were blessed in some way by joining us. We invite you each and every Sunday at 1030 a.m., as well as our other weekday Bible study and prayer broadcast that are scheduled during this time. We continue to pray for your health and safety. We are located at 18460 Conant Avenue in the city of Detroit. Be blessed.